Welcome to the Parenting with Impact podcast with your hosts, Elaine Taylor-Klaus and Diane Dempster, co-creators of ImpactParents.com, an online community, award-winning blog, and service organization, helping parents all over the world to raise complex kids become capable, independent adults. Hi, everyone. Elaine and Diane here. And we know that you want your complex kids to grow up to be happy and independent. And yet you're not always sure how or when to help with that. In this podcast, we'll encourage you to collaborate with all kinds of complex kids and support them in navigating life and learning. And we'll interview leading experts from around the world, as well as parents in our own community, talking about how training for parents actually helps these complex kids. We'll talk about the issues we hear parents struggling with all the time and how a coach approach can support and empower your amazing young people. We won't tell you what to do. We're going to help you figure out how. So let's move on to the next conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode in the Parenting with Impact podcast. We are, this is going to be a really interesting and kind of different (laughs) podcast episode today. So our guest is Kelly Pickens, who's a certified ADHD nurse practitioner in Wisconsin. And she's here wearing several hats today. She is, um, has been a client in our community and is a parent of complex kids. She's a she's a complex adult herself and is now <laughs> has now started a business, has been working with one of our coaches to get support, starting a business supporting other adults and, and assessing, diagnosing, surf, uh, treating, managing ADHD. So she's here wearing a lot of hats. And one of the biggest reasons I invited her, other than it's always great to get a story of somebody who's kind of gone through this journey, is that she's got some really cool history about ADHD in particular that I had never learned before. And I'm really excited to ask her to share it with everybody. So we've got a lot going on. It's going to be a great conversation. Um, Should we dive in? Can we tell us a little bit about your journey, your backstory, how you ended up doing what you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Um, Thanks for having me, by the way. This is pretty exciting. Yeah, so the backstory for me is in January of 2020, I had been a nurse practitioner, a family nurse practitioner for 17 years. And usually every January, I would take maybe the first week of January to take maybe five days aside to do my continuing medical education sessions. Because, you know, as a nurse practitioner or a PA or an MD, you've got to do a certain number of medical credits per year to stay licensed, right? Right. So, you know, I opened up the catalog and looking at it in alphabetical order and what was on the top, (laughs) adult ADHD. (laughs) And I thought to myself, oh, adult ADHD. I'd like to hear what's new, you know, in adult ADHD, because, you know, at that time it had been 17 years since I was in school. And so I didn't know much. I thought I knew some. As I went through the program, it just became so clear to me two things. One, I knew nothing about adult ADHD. Two, I had ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Double whammy kind of, on the learning. <laughs> <laughs> it was just sort of revelation after revelation, my jaw dropping lower and lower to the ground. Right. Um, as I realized how it, just like every other late diagnosis person, It put the pieces of the puzzle together for, you know, explaining the, you know, struggles that I had had experienced my entire life, despite being a successful nurse practitioner. Right. So that's kind of how I came to fall in love, I guess I would say, with ADHD, because instantly I was just so grabbed by the gravity of, of the diagnosis and what it means, because I don't think I really ever took it seriously. Yeah. I think. And I realized that I had bias against ADHD as a diagnosis, against the treatment of ADHD, and against probably people who were seeking a diagnosis for that. Yeah. So, well, so and, wait, let's, I want to, I want you to really, I want to really hit what you said because that's mm-hmm. really going to lead into the rest of this story was right. that that you realized you had a bias against ADHD as a diagnosis, its treatment, and people who were seeking treatment for ADHD. Like, get your head around that, everyone. Right. 
And and I'm and I really want to acknowledge you for recognizing that bias because that had to be really hard to see. I mean, it it was invisible to me until you know it was in my face that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and also, when I you know dug a little bit further, like as as I so. I did this continuing medical education, figured out I had ADHD, sought coaching, did coaching with an ADHD coach for six months, which was more helpful than any other medication or therapy I had ever tried since, you know, I left my family home at the age of 18 and went to college. And then it just made me hungry for more and more and more. So I sought a certification program with the American Institute of Healthcare Professionals. Mm -hmm. And then I did another certification program through PESI. And this all took about, I guess, about 18 months. And in an attempt to sort of like synthesize all of the knowledge that I had gained through all of that training, I put together a presentation for my colleagues um, at my former place of employment. Um, I worked in a, what you would call a managed care organization. So, um, it's it's for adults with disabilities and it's kind of like it's sort of home care it's hard to describe exactly but it's a special needs plan actually probably a lot of listeners are familiar with managed care organizations and, and special needs plans so right <laughs> yeah exactly. you probably all know what i'm talking about but um so this is for adults and anyway i have you know at at that um, uh, job i had probably 12 nurse practitioner colleagues, two physician assistant colleagues and a medical medical director. And we did, you know, we would do presentations. We would kind of, you know, take turns giving sort of updates on topics. And so I put together an hour presentation on ADHD. And so in my like digging for just more information to really like put this together in a way that was appropriate for um, professional colleagues, yeah, how do um, I synthesize I read, everything I've learned about ADHD in one hour? In one hour, the most webinar. important stuff when Before, I have ADHD and prioritizing might or might not be a bit of a challenge. You, <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, in part of doing that, I read um, Russell Barkley's um, handbook. You know, a tome on yes. um, <laughs> assessing, diagnosing, and treating ADHD from you know birth to death kind of thing. And in that book, there is a chapter, and it may not even be a whole chapter, but there is a section on, I mean, of course, he goes into the history of ADHD, but then he goes into the smear campaign against ADHD. Yeah. So I had never heard about this either. Um, in 1987. So wait, before you go into the details, because okay. I want to yeah. I want to really... I want to cue this up because this okay. is this is why Kelly's here, y'all. I have been doing this. I have been in this realm for for almost thirty years. I've been, uh, you know, in in ADHD realm for fifteen years, very very consciously and publicly. And in all these, and I, I guess I never read that part of Russell's book of Russ's book. But when I listened to Kelly talking about this this piece of history. I was like, oh my God, our listeners have got to hear this. And mm -hmm. so, so dive in, but, but understand <laughs> y'all, this is one of those untold stories. This is little the rest known of the history, story, right? Okay. Right. Move okay, forward. Right. Everybody listen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is like the revelation of where I realized where my bias came from. Okay. Right. And where all bias against ADHD as a diagnosis against stimulants as a treatment have were originated. Okay. So first okay. of all, I want to just say, everybody probably knows this from all of your um, teachings. ADHD has been in the medical literature since the 1700s, right? Wow. Okay. Stimulants have been in use. Um, I think the first stimulant was used in 1938. In 1987, the very first meeting of CHAD took place. In Florida, Chad is the International ADHD yes. Organization, right? Yeah, advocacy for a parent group, right? Because this was in the setting of special education services were pretty young, and parents of kids with ADHD 
um, we're seeing their kids not benefit from those services because ADHD was not a diagnosis yet that was um, considered under um, the special education laws. And so there was a lot of awareness around ADHD, a lot of push towards advocating for kids with ADHD in schools. And this, you know, became kind of public, right? Yeah. So ADHD is getting a lot of press. There's a lot of advocacy. And so there is a woman in Texas whose son was prescribed Ritalin and he allegedly had a a reaction. And the mother of this son felt that the school had pressured her to get her son medicated. And so she decided to sue all the doctors, the Atlanta School District, the American Psychiatric Association. And I think that was that was her lawsuit. So that was the first lawsuit that kind of like got things going. Okay, Okay. this sort of launched ADHD and Ritalin into the sector that brought attention from a few very high profile attorneys who had just been successful in taking down big tobacco. Okay. Okay. One of those attorneys had also been involved in taking down asbestos manufacturers. And they had read a book called Talking Back to Ritalin, written by Peter Bregan, who is, he claims to be a psychiatrist. He's not actually a board certified psychiatrist, but he is also um, a very outspoken critic of psychiatry. Long story short, this kind of all got momentum and launched five class action lawsuits against Novartis, who manufactured Ritalin, the American Psychiatric Association, Chad, numerous school systems, numerous doctors. And this all took place. There were class action lawsuits that started in 1987, and many were carried out up until 2002 in different states all over the country. And their their legal strategy was to claim that Novartis conspired with the American Psychiatric Association to fabricate the diagnosis of ADHD in order to sell Ritalin. Wow. So we're going to pause here, Mm -hmm. take a quick break, and we're going to come back to see how this continued to move forward. Hi, it's Elaine. And if you like this podcast, you'll love our coach approach. Whether you're a parent looking for support or professional supporting families, we invite you to download a free guide with 12 key coaching tools at impactparents.com slash gift. You can begin using a coach approach to help kids become more independent or improve all of your conversations at work and at home. That's impactparents.com slash gift. Okay, welcome back. And full disclosure, we've had some time to talk during the break because we really wanted to make sure we use our time super well for the remainder of this podcast. And Kelly has got so much information on this issue that we're going to pull up to about 30,000 feet and and really try to make sure that you guys get the key messages that she wants to make sure that you get. So up until now, what we've talked about was that there was a, a major campaign, the kind of the tobacco attorneys took on this new campaign um, and launched lawsuits all over the country to try to challenge the credibility of ADHD, specifically as a condition, like actually challenging the premise that it was not a real disorder. Um, I'll let you talk about that, explain that in a little bit. And so there was this, this, what started with the media, uh, with a legal strategy then turned into a media campaign. So let's kind of pick it up there and take us from there. Right. So just, you know, reminding that ADHD has been in the medical literature since the 1700s. And up until that time, there was also a scientific consensus. The researchers were all, I mean, as most of you know, like ADHDs, had a lot of different names through the years. I guess it has. (laughs) Understood it, you know, differently through the years, of course, as we do all science. But so challenging that this condition had been made up that year when it had already been established for 200 years 
it really kind of threw things kind of into chaos, I think, a little bit. And it just created a lot of fear um, on the part of parents, Mm -hmm. on the part of schools, doctors. Um, Parents were afraid to medicate their kids. They started pulling medication away because along with questioning the diagnosis of ADHD, they were also focusing on small numbers of adverse effects Mm -hmm. from stimulant medications and taking them out of context and like really blowing them out of proportion and saying that, you know, these medications were like, you know, terrible and dangerous. And yes, exactly. Death sentences. And let me, let me clarify for a second. So we've got this legal campaign that, that was discredited and, you know, during the break, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. There's a quote from one of the judges that shows how, absolutely ridiculous and ridiculous some of this information was and then I, I remember you saying this kind of it it turned it went outside of the legal strategy and blossomed from there into a media strategy that was mm-hmm. funded by citizens commission on human rights is that right that's right that mm-hmm. was the name of it so yeah. so what so from the legal strategy what did it blossom into quickly and then we'll see where it went from there Well, representatives from the Citizens Commission on Human Rights who um, were a lot of them were, you know, had been kind of like in respected professional positions. So in, you know, higher in education and um, actually the the person who founded the Citizens Commission on Human Rights was a former psychiatrist himself who had kind of renounced his profession. They went on talk shows. They went on radio shows, they started distributing um, literature in schools, um, illegally, by the way. They protested national scientific conferences, and their approach was to sow doubt, not just in regular citizens who were trying to, you know, understand ADHD, but also between the scientists. Mm. And it was incredibly effective. Yeah. Um, And that's kind of where was like what shocked me was that I realized through this that the bias that I had against ADHD came directly from this this disinformation campaign and these lawsuits that I had never heard anything about. And through this kind of as this sort of evolved, not only did parents, you know, become just terrified and were afraid to treat their kids. Doctors didn't want to touch ADHD with a 10 foot pole. Mm -hmm. So doctors stopped a lot of. Yes. So even, even though the information was discredited and it wasn't real, the smear campaign did some significant damage in interfering with the practice of medicine. Yes, exactly. I mean, medical schools stopped talking about ADHD. Yeah. Adult ADHD, there are still no questions about adult ADHD on the psychiatric board exam. Wow. And wow. Can you just do that for a minute when you think about how significant a population has ADHD? And and, you know, we were talking during the break a little bit about ADHD has become almost a representative of neurodivergence and a lightning rod for all of of neurodivergence and mental health and mental illness and well, and there there may be another podcast episode in this, but I am under the impression, check me on this, is that that it for a long time it was thought that ADHD only lasted up until a certain age. And so the whole thing about adult ADHD, yeah. I think might have might be completely a different sort of thing, but clearly this would have impacted our ability to really recognize and diagnose and treat and support adults with ADHD because there's this underlying it, bias that's in the system, right? Right. And it it actually tied in with that because it was in the late 90s that the research was starting to show and actually confirm that, oh, wait a minute, we thought people grew grew out of this. But no, it's looking like maybe at least two thirds of people do not outgrow ADHD. And that was in the late 90s. But all of this tumultuousness was happening. And, you know, the research never stopped. Medical school right. schools stopped talking about ADHD. Doctors really, you know, just kind of became hands off about it because they were afraid to get, you know, sued. Schools kind of 
pulled back too because schools were getting sued. But the research so we've got never healthcare, stopped. disability rights, education. Like you've got a lot of things going on in this one place, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like I said, the research never stopped. They figured out in the late '90s. Well, a that it affected women too, right? Right. Okay. And say, B thank you. that it lasted um, past childhood. Yes. And, but it took until 2013 for the actual diagnosis of adult ADHD to become an official diagnosis in the DSM. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, that's, so, that's like 10 years ago if, as of this recording, right? right? Yes. Yes. That's um, correct. ADHD so how, in adults has only been an official diagnosis for a decade. So I think the question I have, and I'm watching our time is, wait, no. wait, wait Elaine, you just had a face. I, I just... I, ADHD, adult ADHD has only been an official diagnosis for 10 10 years. years. That's mind boggling to me. Right. When you see how pervasive it is and you look at Russell Barkley's other research on the impact that it has on all of these other conditions and life expectancy. And it's just, I'm sorry, I'm having a mind blowing moment. I mean, I, when I put this all together in my mind and I saw the mortality and morbidity statistics associated with ADHD, I, I mean, I want to cry right now because in my yeah. mind, this is, this is a national health emergency. A public, a public yeah. health issue. Yeah. yeah. It is and a public health, health, health emergency because yeah. if people don't know the, the mortality, the expected life, sorry, the estimated life expectancy with ADHD is reduced by 12 to 20 years. That, that is so significant. Un, un, unmanaged. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's yeah. just with ADHD in general. And, and there is an association with treatment and, and protocols for treatment that, that reduces those, those risks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, and we will, we'll add some links to that data yeah. as well. So, so and there's, go ahead. if there's one more thing that I can yeah. say, I just want to say that all of this also created, and this is the saddest part to me is there's a huge cohort of people right? Between who were born, you know, somewhere in the late sixties and between there and maybe like in the late 2010s who did not receive any care or recognition or validation of their, of their disability. And they are all adults now they are becoming Mm -hmm. adults. And so people are wondering like, why are we seeing so much more about ADHD? I just had that conversation the other day with someone. It's like, so what's going on that there's so many more people being diagnosed and this is, you're, you're really weaving. And I, I'm excited to see the book you write, Kelly, because I think you're going to write a book, but it's this sort of <laughs> where, you know, weaving the story of why, why do we have, suddenly have so many adults with ADHD? Well, there's a lot of really good dynamic reasons that have led us to this space not, mm-hmm. not good. That's the wrong word, but like legitimate, uh, legitimate reasons that have led right. us to this space. So how do we wrap up this conversation? Cause I'm, I'm a, aware of our time. That is an excellent question. I mean, I think, you so, know, the message I want to get out there is that ADHD is real. It always has been, we've known about it since the 1700s doubt about ADHD was fabricated. It was all completely fabricated as a legal strategy um, by lawyers who were trying to win class action lawsuits. And the sad victims of that are this enormous cohort of people who were deprived of recognition of their disability. And we need to make sure that we are doing what we can to, to bring awareness to the bias, especially to healthcare providers. Like that's my kind of goal is I want to help healthcare providers recognize their bias and understand where it came from. Mm-hmm. Because I think when healthcare providers recognize, oh, wait, I have actually adopted these views that are completely fraudulent and not based in science, but they just yeah. don't know. Right. Yeah. Well, and the only other thing that was beautiful encapsulation, yeah. um, it's real, it, it, the doubt around it was fabricated, Real people were victims of it. There's an unintended bias in the medical community around it that we need to understand. The only other thing I would add to what you just said was, and that treatment makes a difference. Absolutely. There's lots of ways to get treatment for ADHD. Some of it is medication-based, some of it is behavior-based, but treatment turns it around. And so identifying it, understanding it, and treating it 
is way better than putting your head in the sand and pretending that it doesn't exist. <laughs> right, right. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Kelly, thank you for this conversation. You are such a wealth of knowledge. You, you clearly love the research. You've done the research and your heart in this is really clear. So thank you so much for being with us. How do people find out more about you? Um, they can go to my website, uh, www.uaadhd.com, like undivided attention adhd.com or kelly at uaadhd.com awesome we'll have all that in the show notes and as a reminder if you if you happen to have the the benefit of living in wisconsin kelly is available as a nurse practitioner to work with identify diagnose and treat adhd as appropriate so kind of cool thank you so much if you happen to be in wisconsin or know somebody who is (laughs) <laughs> um, and and as we say, we we will continue to support Kelly and look forward to encouraging you to to write a book to capture more of this. So so if 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 when that happens, we will bring her back to the podcast to discuss it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate and really want to acknowledge you and and your journey and your taking this challenging dynamic in your life and turning it into some place to really serve yourself, serve your kids in the work that you've done focusing on that first and now bringing that to to your work as a nurse practitioner. Um, I really want to honor that. Thank you so much. Um, anything else? Any, do you have a favorite quote or mot- motto you want to leave us with today? Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the motto I think that I kind of landed on with this, and I think we, you know, we talked about it when we were kind of on the break, is that I mean, this isn't my favorite one, but just in terms of this conversation is that ADHD is political. Yeah. Um, that's not my favorite quote, but. <laughs> no, but for this purpose is ADHD yes. is political and, and we've got to acknowledge that in order to, mm-hmm. to learn to be with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think my favorite, like a quote or approach about ADHD is self-acceptance. Hmm. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, I do too. So. All right. Those of you who are listening, you know, Kelly, what gem, you Kelly, yeah, Kelly, thank you again. What gem do you want to take away from our conversation today? Capture an aha for yourself, for your family, you know, maybe a little bit of compassion for those of us who <laughs> kind of have struggled with the results of some of the challenges Kelly shared with us today. What do you want to take away? And remember what you're doing makes a difference for yourself, for your kids, it makes an enormous difference. Understanding what you're struggling with allows you to learn to be with it as effectively as possible. So we really want to acknowledge and honor your being here in this conversation, listening, learning, and and figuring out how to take it forward in your life. Uh, I hope you guys found this useful. I know it was a bit of a departure. And and again, Kelly, thank you for for bringing your expertise and your wisdom to our community. Take care, everybody. You've been listening to the Parenting with Impact podcast with Elaine and Diane. For more information on the Impact Parents community or to join Sanity School for Parents, please visit impactparents.com. If you like what you've heard, please share this podcast with friends who need similar guidance and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the essentials of Elaine and Diane's coach approach to parenting, download a free tip sheet at impactparents.com slash podcast. Behavior therapy training for parents is actually recommended as a first-line treatment for complex kids. For information about Sanity School, our training program for parents or teachers, which has helped thousands of families around the globe, visit impactparents.com slash sanity school.